Hi, and welcome back to module four and section 4.6. We are going to talk about new market development. Sometimes temptation will lead us to make decisions that in hindsight maybe didn't stack up. What I mean by that is that us as humans, just like many organizations, of course, run by humans, will not always be completely objective in the way we go about decisions. And we see this sometimes with new market development. We see this with organizations that want to expand and perhaps do it quickly. And the decisions don't, or the decisions that they make at the time don't always stack up later on when we review the disaster. For instance, a company like Slater and Gordon, Australian law firm. If you don't know them, look up, just Google in Slater and Gordon and expansion into the UK or just put UK disaster or something like that and read about it. Quiz, Mazda, you should all know that car name, has been very successful in Australia. Its business model is designing and manufacturing cars in Japan. Marketing is tailored to the Australian market. Sales and service operate in Australia. Which of the following international growth options are they using? If you don't know what this is about, you're gonna to need to read the study guide. Uh, other than that, please pause the video and have a go. Export foreign sales subsidiary. Why might it be that? We go to figure, sort of figure is it? Table 4.18. So here you can see, it's pretty straightforward. An integrated domestic firm, everything is going to be domestic. A foreign agent distributor, you're going to design and make in your country. Sales is done outside. Right? After sales service is even done from your country. Foreign sales subsidiary and foreign production subsidiary, what we're doing then is obviously production is in the, the country that the mark, new market that you're selling into with the foreign production subsidiary. And of course it's not here. Um, and also with the sales subsidiary, that means that you do, you can have an element of head office marketing, which most companies will, and then you have to have tailored marketing, sales, customer uh, customer service, all in your target market. Right? So that's how you would read that table and how you use it for an MCQ question. So what might be the strategic reasons for wanting to go into a new market? An obvious one is that it's market related, as in you make agricultural products here, and the US has the, the same types of farmers and uh, businesses that need those agricultural products. So it's market related. Also, you have resource related. And that means, uh, again, if you make a certain agricultural product here, a particular fertilizer, for instance, and that's because we have the stuff in the ground to dig up for those fertilizers, but so does the US and they have a lot of customers, then we've got a resource related ability to go to a new market here. Yes, we could ship it all over, but it opens up other opportunities. Remember, foreign production subsidiary that we can produce in the American market, set up sales in the American market and develop that, even though head office might be in Australia. Of course, think about it too in terms of mining. Where's the resource? At the moment, your resource is in the country that you are able to dig it out of the most cost-effective way and then sell it wherever. But sometimes you might actually want to set up something elsewhere because that particular resource might be lithium and it goes directly into battery manufacturing that might be done in that country. Efficiency seeking, we saw this through the... 60s and 70s when uh, big sports shoe companies moved their manufacturing to low cost labor countries. But then the 1990s and the 2000s, we saw a different move with this. And that was along the lines of companies say like Deloitte uh, set up in India, a subsidiary and it employed Indian accountants and finance people, but also to sell to the Indian market as much as maybe some of those services were used in a sort of offshoring type model to service clients in other countries. But what was changing is the Indian market, the Chinese market, for instance, over a billion people in each country, much faster growing domestic demand in both of those markets than there was 20 years ago. And so that's 
creating opportunities for companies to say, no, we need to set up and service the Indian market. It's not just about setting up a, a call center in uh, Chennai or Bangalore. It's actually about servicing uh, the Indian market with businesses that are growing at a much faster rate in many cases than in many other Western countries. Quality of the business environment. So this particular figure uh, picture here just shows that Germany, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Canada all have an increase in renewable capacity of kilowatts per person at a higher range. Why do we care about that? Well, I make um, inverters. Uh, so I've kept my solar power, power business startup from 20 plus years ago, and now I've moved into making inverters. Well, where am I going to sell those inverters? I want to sell them in markets where the pestle factors or steeple, like political and social and legal factors, are helping market growth. So I look at countries like Germany, Sweden, Norway, Denmark. Yes, they'll have competitors, uh, but also I may have the opportunity to sell into that market because there is a much higher uptake of renewable energy. This table here, it's, um, it's not complex. It's just got quite a lot in it, table 4.15. Perhaps we just use the example here I put on the right. So this is Vault Bank. I think I've mentioned them before, the first digital neo bank to get a license in Australia. However, they're still not really operating. I'm a member, but uh, nothing's coming my way in terms of offerings. But what we want to think about here are the considerations and these this idea of objectives and enablers. So let's just put it Put it to vault, neo bank, digital, no offices, better deposit rates, lower interest on, on loans, um, but, but no frills in a sense. So the expectations for them is that they want to capture a share of the market. They may not know how much at the moment, but that's, that's what they're after. The resources, um, they don't have to access natural resources. They do need skilled labor, but it's not gonna be low cost. And actually the resources are a big deal to them. They need skilled IT labor, fundamentally. That's, that's what they're doing. They've got to meet all their security requirements, but they've also got to personalize and customize, customize their service offerings to me, the customer. So they do need to understand state-of-the-art technology because they should be using things like machine learning algorithms. They need to be close to best practices. They need to be better than the big four banks, which in a sense is not that hard. Some of you may work in those banks and plenty, uh, banking industry is quite conservative and a bit archaic. And if you dig beneath and things like IT systems, you'll find some very old archaic stuff that's sort of just hanging on by its fingertips in terms of not breaking down in some of these banks. And so that's why the neo banks can see an opportunity. Uh, Coordination, set up a base for a global or regional development. Well, they're just setting up a base in Australia. They don't need logistics. They need to be close to other financing institutions, financing institutions though. The, the KPIs, look, yes, it's kind of obvious that if you want to get market share, that's going to be your market. If your resources, it's about your costs, learning, coordination. You can sort of eh, not really link it back to BSC, balance score, cut a little bit. Uh, I think the timing is an interesting one. And also, of course, the mode of entry, which we'll talk about later. So with the timing, you have to think about, well, Vault, what do they want to do? They want it to be a first mover. They want to beat other neo banks coming into the market. Um, and that may be to preempt certain things, probably not resources in this case. Think about a miner moving in, that's preempting others to get the get their hands on resources and what do you call it? Exploration permits and titles and areas. So that's a big thing with mining here. You've got to get your hands on good IT tech resources. Yes. Uh, but you, you also probably want to focus on things like this, the three stages, how are they going to initiate and get people like me in first customers, early adopters, how are they going to grow market share and how are they going to continue to coordinate Going back also to the capability maturity model, a bit from module one, how are they going to go from level one, two, three as they build this business? 
noting that, of course, a bank has to meet a lot of regulatory requirements as well. So that's one way of looking at that table. New market development. Should you do it? Simple questions. It's good to keep GSL like this. Simple. Should I do it? How will I do it? The should I do it is, well, what's the size of this market? Is is it worth going into? Is it growing? So again, we're linking concepts here across modules back to module two. What's the future growth like? What are the industry com competitors like? Okay. Are there already substitute products in this new market that I'm thinking about going to? Or is it a market where there's much better access to complementary products, which is going to help me? Helps my competitors, yes, but it's going to help me grow as well. What's the switching costs like for buyers? So what's the buyer power level like? Is the value proposition right? That's a really important one. Just because you sell a product in your country with a certain uh, culture as well, and that value prop proposition works there, doesn't mean it works in a different country with quite a different culture. Think about things like collectivist cultures versus individualistic cultures. Do you have the resources for the distribution and the service? and everything, but obviously distribution, after sales service, getting the products to the customer is very important. Other considerations, obsolescence and leapfrogging. What we mean by that is we build products and uh, what's the classic? The hot water service is guaranteed for 10 years because generally 10 years and two months, it collapses in Australia. And that's the obsolescence of the product and you need to get another hot water service. But of course, when we're talking about tech products, we've got the, the huge challenge. And we remember, we have this curve that goes like that, but then drops off. And so you have to then come up with your next product development and do the next curve and then do the next curve. That's what's so challenging about the competitive nature of technology. Uh, prices. So is the product valued more elsewhere, right? As well as political and legal considerations. So your product, I don't know, pharmaceutical, for instance, your product can be valued in one country a lot more than another. And it could be related to the health, overall health of the population at other, that other market. Um, it could be related to cultural issues and their acceptance of using medication for certain ailments and illnesses. There's a lots, lots of different things. Uh, yeah, cultures also rate products differently. This last point here, that's an interesting one. I think was the example in the study guide, was it around Hong Kong or something else? And around public transport. Yeah, the Australian market it does not rate public transport highly. We are very much like Americans driven by this car market. In other countries, they rate public transport a lot more highly. A, many people can't afford to buy a car. It's impractical. The, the roads are clogged, you pay high taxes to have one. And so their, their understanding of products and services like public transport is much greater. <clears throat> and so is their, their use of it and their cultural appreciation of it. Examples here, the telephone, Windows XP, you know, uh, obsolescence or Windows XP not being that good. Batteries, remember that the iPhone battery you can't take out as your average customer. You have to unscrew it all and you can pull it out. But there, there's always been an issue there that they go, well, no, this battery's amazing, but when it runs out, we've decided that your phone, your hardware, the software's all run out as well, and we want you to get a new one. Uh, the the phone one is interesting. I think that's related to the, to the Chinese market, which was a really interesting scenario where so many people in China were below the poverty line, many still are, and couldn't afford a telephone. But as China grew and the market grew, they skipped this whole segment. They never got a landline. They just moved to mobiles because this technology had grown so fast. The rest of us that came off the copper line in our history as kids and the old uh, dial telephone, I hope you guys know what, what this is. <laughs> Some of you may not recognise it so well, um, but I remember it. And going through all that, to the mobile phone, and then you have a culture that literally skipped that whole segment. I find that quite quite interesting. Uh, potential new geographic markets here, you can see that uh, you can also rank things based on um, what your product is going to be worth, so in terms of your prices. So in a country like Iran, 
um, the cost of living is actually uh, significantly higher. Yeah. So the prices, and of course, we're talking about countries where governments, without getting political, but different government philosophies and approaches about um, government control of industry. Let's put, let's put it that way. So prices will be different. You have to think about where you're going to sell. Individualism, collectivism, I mentioned that before. You know, America, North America, Central, North, European, Scandinavian countries, especially the UK, are very individualistic cultures. But lots of other cultures are not. They're much more socialist. That's what we mean by collectivist. doesn't mean that they're communist. It just means that they play, uh, put a much higher emphasis on social cohesion, how wealth and products and services are distributed across, across the population. In the individualistic cultures, we're much more whoever's got the money, whoever gets it, open market, highest price wins. So with the timing as well, here's the two examples and one I mentioned before. Harvey Norman went into uh, Ireland and I think it was around 2007 and just got the timing wrong. I think in Harvey Norman's defence, a large retailer of homewares uh, in Australia, in their defence, they couldn't have picked the GFC completely, so the collapse of the credit market starting in the US, but also they could have paid probably more attention to what was happening in terms of the amount of personal debt levels in these countries. I think the temptation here, going back to my first slide, is that they they see countries where people are racking up more and more personal debt. So they're getting more, hold of more credit cards, more personal loans, and they're buying products. They're buying fridges and couches and side tables and lamps and televisions. And retailers look at that and go, fantastic. But of course, they have to consider that one day things may change. Interest rates now in the US are going to go up much earlier and much faster than anticipated because of the economic stimulus. So the similar thing has to occur in Australia. What's that going to do to our addiction to debt? I don't, I don't know. But you want to think about it if you're a large retailer. Slater and Gordon, again, Google it, have a look at it. But basically, they went to the UK and they did not look at the pestle factors properly at all. They didn't seem to understand what the government was considering in terms of their industry and their customer base. Uh, and they didn't see the legal implications. And the market that they bought, they acquired a company to basically acquire a lot of what they call accident and injury law work. Um, but the government changed the rules. And so they couldn't, they couldn't get the wins in the court cases that they needed in the payouts and it just collapsed. And the company basically went bankrupt. Somehow it was saved. Key success factors consider, can you leverage those location specific advantages? Right? Whether it's about resources or your knowledge of the market, people that you've got in your current market that you can send to your new one or people that you can attract from competitors. Do you have the strategic capabilities and the competencies to deal in that new market? And does the potential for growth overseas outweigh staying at home? And I've got it in there because again, you read the business news and cases and you see these companies do it and then you see their market share in their originating country was 8%. Okay, well, why didn't we put a proposition to the board to grow that to 14%? That could be worth half a billion dollars in revenue to us and significant profit. But sometimes the temptation is, well, we're still going to do that, but we're also going to stretch our resources and go to the UK, we're going to go to Indonesia, going to go somewhere else. Uh, when you're looking at how you get information about going to new markets, so there are things that you can access like the IMD World Competitiveness Yearbook, the World Bank. Uh, so you just have to think about if you are in a corporate strategy team and you're being asked to look at this from the broad perspective, what sort of markets might our organisation go into? You'll need to be doing a lot of research to try and understand that data. All right, modes of entry quiz. I'll let you read this, pause the video and have a go at the quiz. Wholly owned new operations. Anyone know which company we're talking about here? So it's a true case. It's Walmart. Walmart going into Europe and specifically wanting to go into Germany. And Walmart 
have and had back then a huge amount of money. So they had the capital to do it. And they were very clear about wanting to take the Walmart brand, the American culture, everything into this new European market. Uh, they wanted to be the dominant leader. So they weren't interested in doing joint ventures and capital wise, they didn't need to, nor strategic alliances. They could have acquired, but they wanted to control everything. So wholly owned operations was the, the best approach for them. So you want to export your amazing summer sandals, read this particular mini case, okay, and have a go at the quiz uh, here. This the, I like these questions because you need to pull the information out of the case and analyse and evaluate. So higher order type questions. Pause it, have a go. You are direct selling via the internet and should change to indirect selling using a third party platform. To look further at this question, you can go back to uh, table 4.16, all right? You're setting up your own website, your own e-commerce store, but your sales have been slow. Your cost of acquisition is much higher, right? Then, uh, than what you hoped for, what you anticipated. And this is hurting your bottom line because you only have access to a small amount of debt. So you're undertaking direct selling and it's costing you too much and you're not getting the cut through. So what can you do? Think about the third party platform. Put it this way, you simply have your website, you're spending a lot of money on ads and trying to get it up there. Why not consider just selling through Amazon? All right, you own 66 petrol stations across WA. Read through this case, pause it, and have a think about which um, market entry would Aldi be attempting. Anyone get strategic alliance? All right. The reason for this, if you think about it, if we just put the the tables that you can refer to away for one side because candidates tend to go, I must find all the ticks in this table and then, and then that will be the exact answer. No, just think about it as the as the story. Um, your Aldi, a, do you want to take over the running of hazardous goods sites? Class three flammables, large tanks of gasoline under the ground, all the requirements around it, all the health and safety, all the uh, legal requirements, the environmental requirements around that? Um, <clears throat> or do you want to team up with somebody who has that but will enable you to use the mini mart type process and push your products through and work out what the cut is between? That's going to be the preferred option. And, of course, that's the option that exists. Also, candidates will... Uh, often write in to say, I'm really getting stuck between a joint venture and a strategic alliance. Please have a look at the example. It's a very practical story again um, about a builder and his friend. So have a look at that video on guided learning and that tends to get rid of most of people's questions around this. It tends to be a popular video. Foreign direct investment. So that's another <laughs> angle on this. Just understand that term FDI and the idea of Greenfield and Brownfield. So in Greenfield, you've got some IP and you don't want to transfer that to any other party. You want to protect it. You do have the capital and you have the risk appetite to do it. Uh, the market's attractive enough and the market you want to go into, you can get through the red tape. So you can go Greenfield. It's the more expensive. Generally, you're setting it all up. Yes, it's related to the wholly owned operations i'm sorry it's just another term you will you will hear greenfield and brownfield when you read business news more than you will hear um probably strategic alliance wholly owned operations you will hear the word joint venture a lot especially if you're reading about the mining industry so brownfield just means you want market penetration faster you want to lower the risk of cash losses op from operations right so what are you going to do going to consider merging or acquiring you still got to have the capital because you've got to buy, you've got to buy in. Generally, mergers don't work. So uh, there is a short section in the study guide on mergers and acquisitions. And 
the, again, there are thousands of books on this. If you read the, your business news, if you're interested in that, then you will see lots of examples and you can just Google in failed mergers and go back through heaps. AOL Time Warner was one of the classic ones because of how much money was involved. Part of the problem with mergers and acquisitions is people. Absolutely. It is, it is the executives that see the exit strategy for them or the money and the bonus coming through. It is those damn consultants in the boutique firms that I think um, sometimes are influenced almost through a conflict of interest because the board is saying we have spare cash, we either return to shareholders as dividends or we invest in a positive project, positive whack project. And so uh, the consultants go, well, we'll just come up with some ways for you to spend this money. And merging and becoming the biggest is also, I think, part of great for people's ego. So they merged in 2000, a value of 165 billion US dollars. I can't even comprehend that much money. In 2002, they had to write down 99 billion, right? Um, Bunnings acquired home base in the UK, didn't work. Woolworth started masters in Australia, didn't work. You end up writing down a lot of money. So the reason that you want to do it or the reason that consultants have sold it to you is that you can consolidate, is that you can quickly get global reach if you don't have it or you're in two markets but you want to be in four. Uh, you can do it and achieve vertical or horizontal integration. So you can say, I'm going to acquire something up the industry value chain. So now I own the manufacturing when I've just been doing the design and the delivery. Uh, you get that immediate diversification. And that is another problem for many organizations tempted to say, well, we can we can diversify. Uh, there's so many examples. Um, Lion. So Lion Nathan was a alcohol drinks company in Australia, mainly beer, very old. And then they decided, I can't remember if they decided before or after Kieran, a large Japanese company, had bought them, that they would go and buy a juice company, Australia's largest juice company called Berry Juice. So fine. The problem was there was this overconfidence, again, that they could run juice just like they ran beer. And you could say, well, I don't know, much the same. Beer goes in a bottle, juice goes in a plastic bottle. Okay. Okay, what's the big difference? But there was significant differences how you sell the product, distribute the product, deal with your customers over the two. And again, it was a bit of an unmitigated disaster. Short-term value, cash benefits, tax breaks. You immediately diversify, you immediately expand. You can leverage debt. So thinking about your accounting stuff, gearing in terms of how you look attractive to investors. You can get some immediate savings. Generally, they never occur. Whatever you get told will be the synergies and the savings reductions. Every time I read about that, 12 months later, I find that the company didn't achieve those savings. And unfortunately, it's all linked to short-term incentives for senior managers. You could say, you know, oh, Chris is not a fan of mergers and acquisitions, but I'm reflecting the stuff that I've read. Um, I've only really been involved in one, yeah, of a decent size, but uh, it's really out of my reading and it, it's just, just read yourself. It seems to be case study after case study of things not going well. There are some guidelines, table 4.17. You might refer to them when writing a written answer to a case question about a company that believes its strategic option is to merge. Now, the pre-webinar question, you've all done this work, adapted from something called the Go Gear case. That doesn't matter. We've got three paragraphs here. You can pause now and look at this if you haven't before, but really you want to spend a bit of time because now I'm just going to run through the different modes of entry. So that's a really important section and there's a couple of tables related to it in module four. So we have exporting. It's what GoGear do now. It got them to get their product to the US relatively quickly and the IP risks are relatively low. It's your product, it's your IP. You just use an agent to get it into stores. You tend to not get the market penetration if you want fast growth. The financial returns with all the cuts are all the players in this value chain of getting it across through export all want, they want their cuts. So your margins can be lower. Um, they won't likely achieve the very aggressive targets that they probably 
have or do have. Licensing, low setup costs, fantastic. Get into the market really quickly. High penetration than exporting, but you've got limited control. That's very important. And this one's very important to many companies, IP leakage. If you license, you get all the agreements signed that you will not steal our IP, even though you now know the design, how to manufacture it. If there's special distribution, you know how to do that. Um, but the reality, a lot of corporate espionage occurs every single day. And so it's risky. Franchising, they get control of um, the brand. If you franchise, you're taking, this is how I look. I'm, I am Boost Juice and I want to franchise and put it everywhere and every single store will look the same. It's a lower cost of, than wholly owned operations because your franchisees have to buy in. Uh, probably the market penetration is too low for what GoGear's goals are. The financial returns are sort of medium, but it could take a while to be realized. Right? Capital costs are higher than exporting and licensing because you've got to do all of this upfront marketing and standardization, really, of your product and your offering. Strategic alliances can be good. Um, speed of entry can be good. You're not Generally, you're not setting up as a, an official joint venture type scenario where you're both putting in significant amounts of capital at the start. Uh, so, and technology leakage is still an issue, but you're more separate than you, what you are in a JV. In a JV, it's more costly than licensing and franchising, probably more costly in a strategic alliance. It depends what sort of strategic alliance we're talking about. Um, and remember in that video, a joint venture is a type of strategic alliance, right? Uh, the penetration perhaps is not as good as wholly owned and acquisitions, right? Where And you don't have quite as much control. You do often have a fast speed of entry because both organisations are putting in a decent amount of capital to get going. Uh, and sometimes you have better sharing of systems because you're more closely integrated. These two companies set up a new entity, put money in, take people from both the companies, put them in, hope that they work too well to get work well together a, a broader strategic alliance you, you're just a bit more separate so that shell have all of their systems that don't link probably in many ways to coals right but they have a couple of links because those stores need to be filled but the stores the products in the stores the mini marts and the service stations have got nothing to do with the petrol coals don't have to worry about anything to do with class three flammables and all of those safety issues and environmental issues and transport and logistic issues and supply issues and vice versa, they shell don't care about. The chocolate, they just want to know it's there being sold at the front bench and that they're getting a cut. Wholly owned or acquisition. So you have control, but it's just cost, cost, cost. That's the main thing. Um, it can be much slower entry because you've got to set everything up. So you acquire all the land. Think about masters and how much land they had to acquire stage by stage. And then if you read the stories about it, Bunnings had a very good tactic against that to, to actually slow them down as well and make them pay more than they wanted to. And then you've got to build all the stores and then you've got to stock them all and get all the, the local labour. So it's it's slower. But, of course, if you own everything and you become massive, it can be very profitable. Also, there's accounting issues in geographical expansion. Foreign exchange risks, if you sell another country, you've got to receive most likely receive the cash in that currency and then convert it. But of course you can hedge against FX volatility. Um, preparing multiple accounts, extra administrative burden, may only affects things like wholly owned joint ventures, perhaps franchising. Incompatible systems, it's always a huge issue with IT across different, uh, different organizations, whether you acquire or merge, um, but probably when you're wholly owned, you're setting up your own. No, because IT across the world is pretty similar. The servers are everywhere. You use Amazon Web Services or Azure or somebody and everything's on the cloud. So that's that's changed, actually. Taxation and transfer pricing. If you don't understand transfer pricing, Google it, look it up. But also we have the video that you can look at. Different business conduct standards. This is an important one in different countries through culture, government, other reasons, they have different ways of doing business. And if you blindly walk in to another country because of a geographic expansion project and don't consider things like their judicial system, what is your right of reply? What is your right to challenge if the government there or if a competitor walks in and steals your IP? 
can you do anything about that? In some countries, you can't do much at all. In other countries, you can do a lot more. You have to consider that. An example there, Bellamy suffers a blow when China just said overnight, um, we're, uh, we're stopping the export license. It's revoked at the moment or it's put on hold. And they're like, what? What the hell do we do? Right. And the problem for Bellamy's too is they solely relied on the Chinese market because it was so big, it was so valuable, it was so profitable. The Chinese consumers were paying so much for organic infant milk formula. They did get it back up and running, uh, but they would have had some very stressful months. Have a look at the two videos in guided learning on that. Sorry, this was a longer webinar. Uh, it's a big section and it's definitely, I highlight it for MCQs, but also in case analysis, whether it's the vignettes with MCQs or it's the written section, because it's so common as part of a story about a strategic development going somewhere else. How do we go? Is it worth going? And then how do we get in there? Which mode of entry? Why? What are the risks associated? Are there transfer pricing issues we need to consider? You want to be able to look, understand and list those things in your answer. All right. We move on to section 4.7 next. See you then.